book of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament, page 661, if you have a Bible like mine. If your Bible is not like mine, you're just going to have to find it. And, uh, but Nehemiah, we're going to spend a few weeks in uh, Nehemiah. I've preached through a section of Nehemiah several times. And uh, I really believe that right now, as we are as a church, hoping to be moving away from the C word, yeah. COVID. You know, and we're trying to move away from that. And, you know, we went through shutdown, and then we went through uh, very limited church stuff, and then we kind of opened up. I thought about uh, Nehemiah. Matter of fact, the verses that we're going to read today, I, I really thought about today, uh, our, our day and time. So, in Nehemiah chapter, well, let me read the first 11 verses. Chapter 1. And I'm going to start, I'm going to read the first 11 verses. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, during the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. They said to me, the remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That's a key verse to the whole book of Nehemiah, praying and fasting before God. And here's his prayer, Lord, God of heaven, so the great awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. Let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer that I now pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly toward you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinances you gave your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant. If you are faithful, I will, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to give my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to, the, to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man at the time I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah had a burden. And it drove him to his knees in prayer. God had told the people when they, because of their unfaithfulness, that they were going into exile. There were some of the false prophets who had said, just hang on, we're not going to be here long. God said, settle down. Move in. Live life. You're going to be here a while. They were there 70 years. But God began to work and they began to return to their land, returning to Jerusalem, and they found their city in ruins. 
They dove in real quickly and did some work. But they got discouraged and they had opposition and they got tired and they felt like they were alone and they didn't complete the task. And as I read it, that's kind of what I thought about uh, the church. Man, we, we went into exile. You remember? Man, I remember uh, going online and a little handful of us uh, music leader and piano player and a couple other folks we were meeting over in the dining hall so we could live stream and and uh, you know we we're shut down for a few weeks and then we had Sunday morning but no Sunday school and, and, and no Sunday evening no Wednesday night and we slowly kind of opened things back up eventually but I really feel like that we didn't finish the task When we open the doors, Amen. but there's a work that God wants to do. I, I'm convinced that during the time that things were really kind of shut down in COVID, what God really desired of us was for us to be on our faces before him in prayer and repentance, getting right and getting ready for when we open back up. Amen. And and. And we failed in doing that. Oh, Nehemiah wants news from home. And he got the news. Now, he didn't dwell in the past. He didn't spend a lot of time well, enlisting all the failures and all the problems he has that hey, we've sinned. But God, hear my prayer because we want to go forward. And I think that's what we need. We need to say, Lord, we, we've sinned. We've been unfaithful. But God, there is a work for us to do. Amen. There are people that need to be saved. And there are families that need to be reconciled. And, and there are people that need ministered to. Look, our folks up here yesterday doing yard sale, and they met a number of people who were very transparent in talking about church. What are you doing? What's going on? What, when is it? And, you know, which reminds us, I mean, there are people that are hurting, and many of them would respond if we invited them. I saw some numbers this last week that they've worked on, and it was amazing but really it just kind of confirmed what we already knew the number of people who will go to who will attend church depending on who invited them and just about the worst percentage were those who were invited by the pastor But the best percentage were those who were invited by a friend that they knew had some kind of relationship uh, that encouraged them to come be a part of church. See, hey, there's one of me, but there's a whole bunch of y'all. And that's the best anyway. So, man, get to inviting people. Man, call them, write them, invite them. How many of you invited people to be with you in Sunday school this morning? <laughs> How many of those folks weren't here? Don't quit. Hey, I had some that I invited that called me and they said, we won't be there because of, like, but we'll be there next week. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, uh, just keep inviting, keep, keep, keep calling, uh, keep reaching out. You might hear about his city. And he got a heart burden. 
where I see a revival, it's going to start with a heartburn. If you're going to have a revival in your family, it's going to start because you get a real burden in your heart. If we're going to have a revival in our church, it's got to start with a burden uh, in, in, in our own heart. Nehemiah had that kind of burden. Uh, matter of fact, let's just kind of go back through these verses. We see his concern. He asked, when he, when he saw that some of the folks who had been in Jerusalem, he said, tell me, those that have gone back, what's it like? <clears throat> well, they're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall has been broken down, and the gates have been burned. Now, folks, listen. You know how long the city had been in that condition? It had probably been a hundred years. There had been a little remnant of return knees entered Jerusalem under Zerubbabel. And they said, I'm sure, we're going to get busy, and we're going to fix the gates, and we're going to fix the walls, and we're going to get everything cleaned up. And man, we're... And a hundred years later, it hadn't happened yet. You know what that tells me? These were bad. We're going to do it. We know we need to do it. We know we ought to do it. And we're going to. We are. We're going to pray for revival. We're going to canvas our area. We're going to reach our community. Listen, communities change so much nowadays, and especially communities like Kavanaugh area. In the last five years with us saying we're going to reach our community, we've had complete turnover in who's here. If we had have reached our community five years ago, Today, there would be a whole new community to reach. He said, well, that's a little bit depressing. Well, don't be depressed. Just, just think, God's bringing us prospects. God's setting the table. All we need to do is take part and do our work. Ne Nehemiah heard about uh, these. this problem. What, he asked, what about the people? What about the city? Don't you know that he is hoping for good news? Don't you know that, that he was hoping they're going to, oh, you won't believe what it looks like. And you won't believe how sparkling the gates are. Tell me about the people. Mm. They're in great trouble. Affliction. Disgrace. They're spiritually desolate. Now, by this time, Ezra had already instituted many reforms. That they they knew what they ought to do. They knew what they needed to do. They just hadn't done it. Again, doesn't that sound like okay. Most of us don't need more information. We know what we ought to do. <coughs> we know we need to do it. We just haven't done it. It's not that we need more information. We just need to act on the information that we have. To walk with God, to confess our sin, and walk with God, and settle down, and do business with God. So the people were in affliction, and the city, the walls were broken down, and the gates were burned. 
The gates and walls of a city indicated for the citizens of that city the greatness and the glory and the strength of the city. When you came to a city and you saw beautiful gates, clean and sparkling and shining, massive in size and weight, that gave you an indication of the city that was there. But if you came to a city and the uh, gates were hanging on one hinge and, and, and hadn't been worked in a while, and they're, that also told you something about the city. I remember when we flew into Bangkok on a mission trip. And we left the airport and right driving and we're going to the Baptist Center in Bangkok where we spent our first night and, and uh, doing a great ministry and, and had a place for us to stay. And, and so they picked us up. We're, I want you to know the grounds of that Amazing. Superbly well kept. I mean, it was like kind of made me feel guilty that we weren't as clean and neat and perfect. You know, we left the airport for pretty good ways. We were on kind of, the road was kind of elevated. And up here was brilliance. One large building. You remember, shaped like an elephant. Because that elephants are a big deal in Thailand. And so, so and I remember that was pointed out to us. Look over there. And so, we're, so we're riding along and we're looking at all, I mean, just like, wow. The most modern, beautiful, sparkling city. And then after a little while, our attention would look down. There's a whole other city. Totally different from this up here. We went out our first afternoon. And we walked out a main road uh, in the city, main street. And, and, what, and I mean, it was just fabulous shops and, and things. And, and we walked down, we went in, we did a little buying, you know. And we went in a 7 Eleven, and, uh, you know, got, and, and, and so on our way back, we turned. And we went one block for our return trip. And it was like we had gone to a different world. They were washing dishes kind of in the gutter <coughs> along the side of the street. They had little gas cookers that they were cooking on there on the sidewalk. I took a picture for my nephew who's an electrician because there was this giant bird nest of wires. I just took a picture of it and I asked Josh, do you think that's code? <laughs> because what people would do in the, they didn't have electricity and they would wire in to the wiring on the pole. And if they did it right, they had electricity. If they didn't do it right, they had a funeral, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, and one block over, see those gates. It's kind of like our uh, coming into the city and here's the, the beauty of the city. You remember that. Uh, in, in, in the gospel, it tells us that we're to make the paths straight. 
And that goes back to the historical, if, if a dignitary was come into the city, and you know, well, he's going to be entering, he's going to, there's a dignitary coming, and they're going to come over the, the Garrison Avenue Bridge from, uh, from the rolling side, and they're going to come in. Man, we would send out a crew, and we would scrub that bridge, and we would fill every pothole, and we'd smooth out every bump. And if there was a curve, we'd straighten the curve out. We'd make sure, it, because that first impression, we wanted we want it to be good. Well, Nehemiah knew that the gates and the wall that showed something about the condition of the people. But sadly, the people there, their condition was just like the gates and the walls, a little broken down, a little burned. What's the report on the gates and walls? Christianity in America. We've been at it a long time. I'm afraid the report would be the same. Broken down. Burn. Affliction. Disgrace. Nehemiah asked, and he was told, when I heard these words, verse 4, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Here, here, here's my interpretation of that. Felt like somebody had punched me in the stomach. Took the wind out of my sails. But he knew where to turn. And he prayed and wept and fasted. Why have we not seen revival? When was the last time you've seen the people of God weep and pray for God to move? When was the last time that the church wept and prayed for revival? Why do we not do that? Because we don't realize the despair that we're in. Well, Nehemiah prayed. You all know, see things that, that hurt me. Kind of like Nehemiah. In the last day, seen some of the protests against the possible Supreme Court decision. You know what brings me to tears? I've never seen a closed church that didn't hurt my heart. And maybe it was in a town that all the people left and there's not anything there. And so finally the last thing to be open was the church. Like finally, and, and I don't care that the, the circumstances, man. Hurting churches. Nehemiah didn't point fingers. He, he didn't run to other people down. He didn't say, what are they doing over there? Why haven't they got busy? Why haven't they done something? Why, why haven't they got out there working? He didn't cast 
blame. But he fell on his face for days before God. We need a burden like Nehemiah's. And he prayed. Let me just point out some things about uh, what he prayed. He, he acknowledged the greatness of God. Lord, God of heavens, great and awe-inspiring, keeper of the covenant. That's a good place to start. If we start reminding ourselves of who our God really is, then when we come to that verse that says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength, Listen, if that's who my God is, and he's strengthening me, and he's leading me, and he, sure, I can do it. I can do that because he can do anything. We need to remember who our God is. We need to be reminded that he is a covenant-keeping God. In verse 5, he said, you're an awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant. Verses 8 and 9, he says it again. I'll gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chosen uh, to have my name dwell. Uh, what was it? The covenant that God made, this is going to be your land, your city, your place. I'm giving it to you. And Nehemiah was reminding God, you've made a covenant, but really what he was doing, he was reminding the people. God's made a promise. He's made a covenant. He confessed. I confess the sins we've committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We've acted corruptly. We've not kept the command. Remember, you said, if we come to you, you'll get us, and you'll restore us. <clears throat> Confess. Posted very little about the debates in the Supreme Court work. I did post the other day, and I, I said in my post, this is not time to throw a party and rejoice. For one thing, you're talking about the lives of millions of unborn. The response is not to party. The response is to repent. Oh God, why has it taken this long? Because we've not been serious. I wanted to confess, Lord, you put you put us, you put Haven Heights Baptist Church right here on this corner, right here on this hill, right here in the middle of this community of Kavanaugh area, and, and, and you've given it to us. We've not been serious. We've not been serious enough to pray and to seek you and then to do. In verse 11, first, and he, he, he did acknowledge the greatness of God and reminded God about the covenant and, and he confessed before the Lord. And then in, in verse 11, then he asked, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and that of your servants who delight to revere your name. See, he's already understanding. Everybody's not getting on board. Everybody doesn't want revival. Everybody will never want revival. God doesn't need everybody. He needs a remnant who will revere his name. 
And Nehemiah is ready to be that one that forced a sharp wind. And he prayed. And he said something where you, you may not get the full impact yet until we kind of move on. Give your servant success today. Grant him compassion in the presence of this man at the time I was the king's cupbearer. Here, here, give you a real quick rundown. What Nehemiah was a cupbearer for the king. Maybe he was a food tester. I don't know. You know, let him eat it. If he doesn't die, then the king will have it. He doesn't have that job. And and, and so, that, so anyway, he he every so often it would come up his turn to go in before the king. And it was his time. And Nehemiah's already decided, I'm going to say something to the king about my home, about my city. Could be physically dangerous. He could lose all position, could lose his life. We find out later it, it, it was dangerous to even be sad in front of the king. And Nehemiah couldn't hide it, couldn't help it. The first thing the king noticed was Nehemiah was sad. But God answered the prayer. Then but he asked, Give me success in what I'm about to do. Nehemiah was ready to go to work. He prayed, handled it days. He fasted and prayed. But when he got through fasting and praying, now it's time to do. Folks, listen, we need to pray. We need to fast. We need to repent. We need to fall on our faces before God. But we need to be willing to get up and do. Knock on those doors. Invite. Minister. Serve. Give. If you've read some of the news recently, you've seen reports of evil days. I think it was this morning that I read in just a scanning of headlines, there are like six or eight in a row a shooting here, a gunman there, this many shot, this many killed, this all over small towns, big cities. What's the answer? Jesus. Can our schools deal with it? I've had some tell me in just recent days, boy, this last couple of weeks, we've seen it all. None of it good. What's the answer, Jesus? That's why I believe in camp. That's why I'll even beg for money for camp. So, Brother Steve, you put your money where your mouth is. I do more than that. I put my mouth where my money goes. I go to camp. I'm going to kids' camp. I'm going to Siloam Springs. I don't stay up in the air conditioned. Nice separated cabin. I stay with the kids. <coughs> Choked me up just to think about it. <laughs> Give you two reasons why I go to camp with the kids. By the way, there are not very many pastors. Children's only week. Unless they come up on Thursday night, spend an hour. I'll give you two reasons. There's more, but I'll give you two reasons why I go. Number one, I'm still a kid and I like camp. <laughs> I like Mike Seaball. I'm going to spend the whole week at Siloam Springs just to hear the bicycle sermon on Friday morning. Man, I can't wait till he gives the sermon about jumping on the couch and breaking the lamp. It's good. That's one reason that I go to camp. Second reason I go to camp. Every 
year I've been to camp, I see kids saved. Mm -hmm. There's a big bell out in the mm -hmm. entryway. Right. And when somebody gets saved, they send them out to ring the bell. Right. Sometimes 11 o'clock at night, mm -hmm. you'll be in your bunk, and you'll hear, ding, ding. So that's the answer. That's the answer. Oh, well, you got a burden. I'm not asking to pray today what God wants us to do. I want you to just pray this. God, give me a burden to see you work. I'm just got to start there. Let me pray for you. We're going to say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's the answer. Lord Jesus, I pray that, Lord, give me a burden. Lord, I pray give uh, Brother Jimmy a burden. Give David a burden. Give Randy a burden. Lord, give, give us a burden for our church and for our community. Then, Lord, I ask that as you give us a burden, you'll give us a direction, and you'll fill us and strengthen us to do what needs to be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You